Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining the webinar this afternoon. We're going to be looking at um, protection um, in and deputy ship. Um, it's two minutes past four, so I don't know um, how many people are expecting, but we'll just allow one more minute uh, and then we'll make a start. Right, so we'll, we'll make a start on the uh, training um, and we'll start off with the, we're considering lasting powers of attorney and deputyship in the context um, of local authorities. Um, and I hope everybody can see the slides. Um, if there are questions as we go across the next hour, then please use the question and answers function uh, and we'll try and deal with those uh, as we go along. Uh, and if not, I'll try and respond to those after the training has finished and I hope everybody can see the slides that are on the screen. The context uh, for considering um, legal arrangements for other people to manage an adult's property and affairs uh, arises in three uh, key areas uh, for local authority social services. Uh, the first is um, the need to make arrangements to have someone else support an adult to make arrangements for their property and affairs may be an eligible need under the care act um, and um, there are a number of eligible eligible outcomes under which the ability of an adult to be able to make arrangements to buy food commission services pay for care homes etc uh, will uh, be an eligible need towards meeting an eligible outcome under the CARE Act. And I've, I've put some examples on the screen um, there. They're, they're very straightforward. Um, and there are other eligible outcomes uh, where it might be necessary for arrangements to be in place for somebody else to manage property and affairs of an adult to ensure that they can achieve the outcomes there. But the second context um, is uh, in the context of whether a local authority has a duty to um, assist an adult who may otherwise be a self-funder for Care Act purposes. Um, and the key legislation is section 18 of the Care Act. If a local authority has determined that an adult has eligible needs for care and support, then the local authority must meet those eligible needs for care and support unless um, one of the conditions uh, is, is met. Um, and um, condition three um, is where an adult lacks capacity and there's no person authorised under the Mental Capacity Act to make arrangements for care and support on their behalf. So the, the context is an adult would be a self-funder because they've got significant assets, uh, but they lack capacity to make their own arrangements for provision of care and support, which includes paying for it or making contractual arrangements with a care home and nobody's authorised to do it for them. A local authority in that context might want to support an adult, um, if appropriate, to appoint an attorney or to appoint a deputy um, so that um, its duty to meet care and support needs is at an end. And I put at the bottom, they're often important in ordinary residence disputes. And of course, the other key context is safeguarding adults from exploitation, coercion and control. And there are often cases where uh, a vulnerable adult is living in the community um, and family members are using their bank cards to pay for their own uh, expenditure uh, 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 or um, 
misappropriating benefits um, and the local authority wants to do something to move control of an adult's finances away from the adult themselves in order to see that their income is spent on them. Uh, so uh, that is the context. Um, I am afraid we've got a lot of very dry um, legislation um, and policy to get through uh, to cover the topic this afternoon. Um, and we're going to have to skip through it at quite some speed, given that we only have an hour. Uh, but looking at lasting powers of attorney, there are two types, as you'll all know. Uh, there is a, 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 a fine, an LPA that deals with financial decisions. Um, and there's LPA, which grants authority uh, in respect to health and care. The biggest difference between the two types of authority uh, is finance and property. Lasting power of attorneys uh, can start. The donor still has capacity if the donor says so in the instrument. Whereas um, health and care lasting power of attorney is only effective um, where the adult lacks capacity to make their own decisions about care and support. This training session is focusing primarily on finance and property. In order for a lasting power of attorney to, to be have to be met, uh, the first is that attorneys who have been appointed have to be uh, over 18 themselves. Uh, they need to um, uh, not be bankrupt um, and they need to uh, be appropriate to make the arrangements. Uh, the second is that the donor, the person granting the attorneyship over their affairs must also be 18 or over. Uh, and at the time they grant uh, or donate power of attorney to their attorneys, they need to have capacity to be able to take that decision. The third is that a lasting power of attorney will not take effect until it has been registered with the Office of the Public Guardian. Um, and um, it has to pass through all of the OPG, the Office of the Public Guardians, Guardians uh, tests and requirements before it will be entered into the register. Um, most powers of attorney that we deal with now since the 17th of July 2020 um, can be seen online um, on the OPG's website to see uh, whether they've been submitted for registration. If so, the progress towards registration and once they are registered, confirmation that the LPA has been registered and a summary of its powers. Um, that's useful for an attorney that has a registered power of attorney because they can direct banks and other institutions to the OPG's website to allow them to make their own inquiries uh, and deal with an attorney. It goes without saying that an unregistered lasting power of attorney does not afford any authority or legal powers on attorneys to make decisions on behalf of the adults. The fourth requirement is that the application has to be made using form LP1F or for health and welfare, LP1H. Um, it has to be the prescribed form. Uh, the fourth is that applications have to be certified uh, by uh, an appropriate person. It's usually a professional, often a GP, sometimes a solicitor, um, and somebody who has known the donor or the adult granting the lasting power of attorney for two years. Now, when we look at the appointment of the attorneys, um, they can be appointed. Um, well, first of all, appointment can be for just one attorney who solely um, makes decisions on behalf of the donor, um, or they can appoint more than one attorney. And if they appoint more than one attorney, as is usual, as is common, uh, they can be appointed jointly, jointly and severally, or jointly for some matters and jointly and severally in respect of others. Um, jointly means if attorneys are going to make decisions, they have to do it together. And if they can't agree, uh, they can't make the decision. Jointly and severely means um, that attorneys uh, 
can act together or apart. So an attorney can make a decision without consulting with the other co-attorneys. Um, and jointly, uh, for some, and jointly and severally for other decisions is a mixture of both. Um, and in the instrument, the donor will spell out exactly what decisions have to be made jointly and any other decisions will be made jointly and severally. Um, and they are often uh, decisions um, like the sale of uh, the adult's property uh, would have to be made jointly, uh, but more general day-to-day -day decisions the attorney might, uh, the donor may allow the attorneys to make jointly and severally, uh, such as paying the household bills, um, arranging the shopping and, and, and that sort of thing. That's what happens in practice. Um, when we look at, uh, again, appointment of attorneys, the donor can appoint their husband or wife or civil partner uh, to be their attorney. Um, but unless it says expressly in the power of attorney, if they subsequently uh, divorce, then the attorneyship appointment is also revoked under Section 13 of the Mental Capacity Act. When we look at the um, particular decisions um, for attorneys with fi finance and property, as opposed to health and welfare, the code of practice helps us with what we might uh, mean, uh, what decisions fall in finance and property, buying and selling property, running the bank accounts, um, using the benefits, receiving income, dealing with tax affairs, paying mortgage and rent, insuring the properties, um, and those sorts of things um, that are solely concerned with finance. Some decisions are trickier and they overlap with health and welfare. And at the bottom of the slide here, um, I've given the example which you in local authority situations will be familiar with, and that's where um, an adult is moving home. Uh, and so the decision about where the donor lives is not a decision for the, uh, the attorneys for finance and property. That's health um, and care. Uh, lasting power of attorney but the decision about the arrangements for where the adult moves to live in terms of the rent and uh, or care home fees and the cost of, of living in a new place are taken by the attorneys for finance and property uh, and you'll all know that just like the court of protection a health and welfare attorney um, has to choose from the available options uh, and if the attorneys for finance and property are different people and they say this adult can't afford to live in this care home then the health and welfare attorneys can't move the adults to that particular care home or, or property um, as the case may be very often of course the attorneys for health and welfare are the same people uh, as they are for finance and property um, and um, there's nothing untoward in that at all. In ter terms of an attorney's uh, remuneration, um, they can have out-of-pocket expenses, um, but not much more in ordinary and usual cases. Uh, attorneys can receive um, fees for fulfilling their role if the donor specifically says so, and it has to be in Section 7 of the LPF1 form. Um, and in those circumstances, um, they can be remunerated for their services. And that's what would happen if a solicitor or a professional advisor um, agreed to act as the lasting power of attorney. Um, and that does occasionally happen. So what duties or responsibilities do attorneys have when they are acting uh, on behalf of an adult? Um, the first is that they... Uh, have to abide by the limits on their authority set out in the lasting power of attorney instrument itself. Uh, and occasionally, although in my experience not very often, um, a, an adult, a donor, might set limits uh, on what the attorneys can do. Um, I think the a common one that I do see is in the context of health and welfare, uh, where there are um, restrictions on attorneys' uh, abilities to consent to um, end-of-life treatment, uh, 
uh, or to um, withdraw ventilation um, in emergency situations. Um, very often there are also um, clauses which prevent attorneys from moving an adult into residential care if they have held um, strongly strong views that that's not for them. So that just by way of example. Um, in the context of finance, there are often um, clauses that prevent attorneys from allowing specific family members to benefit from uh, an adult's estate uh, as well. Uh, if there have been family rifts, I've seen those. The second principle is, um, second requirement is to abide by the statutory principles, which I've set out on the subsequent slides. Third is to have regard to the code of practice. And of course, to act in the adult's best interests at all times. So I've set out what acting in best interests means on this slide. Um, and I'm not going to cover it in detail, uh, but it's there for uh, you all to have a look at in due course. Uh, but in effect, it's taking a best interest decision in accordance with section four and making sure that the attorney considers all the relevant uh, circumstances, the things that the adult would have done themselves if they were making the decision, speaking to relevant people uh, involved in the adult's care and support or who the adult would want consulted, um, being mindful of the adult's capacity to make their own decisions, um, being mindful of the adult's wishes and feelings, uh, both in the past and now, their beliefs and values, um, and not acting in a way which discriminates against the adult based on uh, their age or disabilities. Further requirements of the attorneys are to keep records. Um, in theory, the Office of the Public Guardian can ask attorneys to produce receipts. Uh, but in the context of family members who are lay adults, uh, lay individuals, um, the degree uh, of expertise or skill which the attorneys would need to bring to bear um, isn't a high standard um, and um, it's, it's unusual to see attorneys that keep uh, detailed receipts or accounts of the actions they've taken. Um, there are restrictions on uh, an attorney's um, ability to make gifts. They are generally restricted to close family members for birthday, Christmas, wedding and other key dates and they have to be reasonable in the context of the resources available to the adult. Attorneys can't make gifts with a view to avoiding inheritance tax and they can't pay school fees for um, members of the family uh, without prior authorization from the court unless the instrument expressly says so. There is also a requirement um, in the code of practice for a, an attorney to keep their money separate from uh, the adults who are acting for. Uh, but in practice, social workers and solicitors in the local authority will see that very often if there are welfare benefits to be claimed, um, an attorney pays them into their own bank accounts and it becomes difficult to separate out the different adults' funds. An attorney acting under a lasting power of attorney uh, acts as a fiduciary. Um, that means uh, that they owe duties to their principal. They mustn't put themselves in a position where there's a conflict or a real possibility that that will happen. Um, in reality, not just for attorneys, but deputies as well, um, there will be lots of circumstances where there are uh, conflicts. A good example is where um, the attorney is the son or daughter of the adult um, and discussions are taking place around an adult moving into a care home um, and one impact of moving into a care home is that the house is going to have to be sold but of course that's a house which the son or daughter is likely to inherit. Conflicts in that respect are unlikely to be a bar to um, the adult, the son or daughter acting as the attorney if they're acting objectively appropriately. Um, other duties there to uh, not profit from their position, uh, keep the donor's records confidential, um, and not to delegate their authority to anyone else. 
Um, section 27 through to 29 of the Mental Capacity Act sets out uh, restrictions uh, about what an attorney, and in due course, as we'll see at, at deputies as well, uh, can make the decisions they can make on behalf of the adults. Uh, they can't consent to marriage. They can't consent to divorce. They can't consent to sexual relations or a child's adoption. Uh, and they can't vote in an election or a referendum. Although there are procedures in place that allow um, family members to obtain proxy voting rights on behalf of uh, an adult, but they are separate to um, attorneyship and deputyship. So how can a, an, a, an LPA be terminated? Uh, they can be terminated by the donor uh, revoking the instrument. Uh, if the attorney disclaims their appointment, i.e. if the attorney says, I don't want to do this anymore, uh, by operation of law, um, death of the adult, bankruptcy of the adult, or incapacity of the attorney. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a breakdown of a marriage or civil partnership if the attorney uh, is the wife, husband, or civil partner. Um, if there are joint uh, attorneys, um, then um, just sticking with that side, if there are joint attorneys, and for example, the marriage breaks down and the spouse um, is removed as the attorney, but there's another attorney, then the LPA will continue with just removing the disqualified attorney. So the whole instrument doesn't fail. It's only terminated in respect of the uh, attorney um, that uh, has been divorced by the adult, or if it's the attorney's incapacity, uh, it's just that particular attorney that's disqualified. That seems to be a repeat of the last slide, so apologies for that. Um, I put on the slides here to assist you all, because sometimes social workers and local authority solicitors help attorneys to um, revoke, uh, help donors to revoke a lasting power of attorney if they've changed their mind, for example, in a safeguarding uh, investigation. If social work team are uh, appropriately supporting an adult to revoke their lasting power of attorney, that there is a template of a letter which could be sent to the OPG. And that is a template of the deed of revocation um, that can be completed uh, to allow that to happen. So the adult will complete that um, and send it off with the letter on the previous page. Um, the law does afford um, a wide margin of protection around attorneys if they think that they're acting with a valid lasting power of attorney and reasonably in all of the circumstances, then they won't incur any personal liability. Um, if there are disagreements between the attorneys, um, particularly when they're jointly appointed, um, then that too might trigger the local authority's interest from a safeguarding perspective. And in the first instance, um, those matters should be raised with the attorneys to say, look, there's this problem. Um, it's causing difficulties for the adult who's uh, in limbo. Um, and what can be done to address it. And if that doesn't work, um, then a referral can be made to the Office of the Public Guardian. Um, so what to do if the local authority has concerns uh, that the attorney is not performing their duties properly? Um, I've spent some time in the slides on this because um, I think this is probably one of the key issues which you as local authority professionals um, want to uh, find out more um, so, the starting point is, as I say, if there are concerns, meet with the attorneys and discuss it with them. Um, cards on the table, tell them what the concerns are, tell them what you're going to do if you can't resolve the issues. If that doesn't work, then the first thing the local authority might do is report a concern about an attorney to the Office of the Public Guardian. Uh, the Office of the Public Guardian is there to supervise attorneys um, in how they discharge their functions as the adult's attorney and make sure they're doing all of the things, um, all uh, complying with all of the responsibilities and duties imposed upon that we just uh, imposed upon them that we've covered in the earlier slides. Um, and the OPG has um, lots of powers to deal with the situation. 
uh, including that it might make direct a court of protection visitor to visit the attorney and investigate. It might refer the matter to the court of protection, uh, asking uh, the court to consider cancelling the lasting power of attorney. Um, and the court might also order the attorney to compensate the donor for any uh, losses. The Mental Capacity Act, section 44, at the bottom of the slide, also created the offence of ill treatment or willful neglect of an adult, uh, and that's a criminal offence, and the local authority might refer to the police in those circumstances. One of the particular difficulties, um, in my experience, with referrals to the Office of the Public Guardian um, is that it takes months and months and months for any action uh, to happen. And very often by that point, if financial abuse is suspected, um, not only are all the adults um, resources uh, gone, um, but chances of recovering them uh, have dwindled too. Um, and invariably um, little to no action is taken against family members who um, abuse their position uh, in this way. Um, so local authorities also have the power uh, to apply to the Court of Protection themselves um, to um, say that the attorney isn't acting appropriately and ask the court to do one of a number of things, uh, including uh, impose requirements of closer supervision or appoint a deputy instead. Um, circumstances where the local authority might do that uh, most obviously arise in its safeguarding capacity. And that might be that the adult is living at home and their needs are being neglected because they don't have money to get out and about in the community. They don't have money to pay for food on the table uh, and they don't have money to commission domiciliary care if they're assessed to pay for it. It might be that the adult is in a care home and they are liable to pay their own care home fees and the placement um, is at risk because those fees aren't being paid. Uh, very often, if an adult is self-funding a care home placement, they may have gone to a nicer uh, or more expensive luxurious care home than that which the local authority is obliged to commission under the Care Act. Uh, and so there could be a real risk that the adult would have to be moved to an LA rate or cheaper care home uh, if the uh, safeguarding issues aren't addressed. So in those circumstances, a local authority can make an application to the Court of Protection and legitimately, legitimately say the concerns in respect of the financial safeguarding need to be addressed um, with more degree of urgency or expediency uh, than would be the case if a referral was made to the Office of the Public Guardian. On this slide, I've set out the forthcoming proposed reforms to lasting power of attorneys. Um, I'm not going to go through that information, but it's there if you want to have a look at that in your own time. Um, so um, a little bit about the Office of the Public Guardian. Uh, they are responsible for maintaining the register of lasting power of attorneys, and they're also responsible for dealing with representations about an attorney and or a deputy um, about how they fulfil the role. role. Um, the website address is there at the end of that link on the website you'll find uh, on the website uh, are all the forms that are needed to apply for a lasting power of attorney or to apply for deputy ship uh, with guidance notes uh, there are links to uh, pages to make referrals to the office of the public guardian to report concerns both as a professional or a member of the public so that's that's the details for the Office of the Public Guardian. If the Office of the Public Guardian is investigating um, a uh, representation, uh, then they usually get in touch with social work professionals that are involved with the adults, um, and they ascertain and seek their wishes and feelings and views uh, and ask for records to be provided. Records should be provided to the Office of the Public Guardian if requested. Uh, they have a statutory power to see them. Um, and you should know that any uh, emails sent by social workers or solicitors to the Office of the Public Guardian will usually be shared with the attorney that's uh, under investigation. 
Um, so they should be uh, professional emails, uh, objectively written. So we're halfway through the training and um, we're on schedule. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up. I'll just have a little look now. No, there aren't any, so that, that that's good. We're moving on now to look at the Court of Protection um, and um, deputies. Um, the Court of Protection, uh, as you all know, is the court established under the Mental Capacity Act, and it has wide-ranging powers uh, in respect of um, lasting power of attorneys. Uh, the court protection can give directions about how an attorney should use the powers. Um, so in the context of um, Section 21A proceedings or Section 16 welfare proceedings, often the issue of what uh, respect has to be given to an attorney with health uh, and welfare uh, attorneyship about where uh, an adult lives. Uh, and the answer is that ordinarily, if a, a health and welfare attorney says they want the adult to live in a certain place, that should be respected unless it's plainly unreasonable and places the adult at significant risk, uh, in which case um, the court can be asked to override the attorney's uh, wishes and feelings or directions about where the adult should live um, and direct the attorney to uh, make decisions in a particular way. Um, so that, that's a good example. Uh, another example um, in the finance and property perspective might be if an adult's moved to a care home uh, and they have plenty of money in the bank and they want to return to their own home and professionals think that could happen by way of a 24-hour package of care and support at home, which, as you all know, usually costs in the region of two or £3,000. And the attorney's saying, well, I don't want to spend the money in that way. You could ask uh, the Court of Protection to look at that, and if they think that is best for the adult, then they can direct the attorney to make those arrangements and pay the bills uh, at the end of the day. Um, so um, that's a useful power that the court has under Section 22 of the Mental Capacity Act. Uh, they could also give extra authority to the attorneys uh, if they need it. Um, they could order the attorneys to produce records or uh, produce statements explaining uh, how decisions have happened or where things have happened. Um, and they can adjudicate upon the validity of a lasting power of attorney. Uh, so most obviously, the validity of a lasting power of attorney will be seen by local authority social workers uh, and solicitors uh, in the context of it being executed um, in circumstances where they've already been assessed, where the adults already been assessed to lack mental capacity to make decisions about their residence and care and support. Um, and as so often happens, um, a few weeks later, somebody pops up with a, a new lasting power of attorney. Uh, and the um, attorneys are saying uh, the adult should live in a particular place. Um, and there are question marks over how that document came into existence. Um, the Court of Protection can revoke a lasting power of attorney, but only if the donor, the adult, does not have capacity to make a decision about revoking the lasting power of attorney themselves. And that was a significant shift when the Mental Capacity Act 2005 came in, because under the previous law, um, the court could revoke enduring power, uh, could, could revoke enduring power of attorneys, even if the uh, adult could make that decision themselves. And if the adult lacks capacity to revoke the lost in power of attorney themselves, the court can do it for them in two circumstances. First, if there was fraud or undue pressure applied them to create the lost in power of attorney. So back to the example I gave about um, somebody who's been assessed as lacking capacity to make decisions about where they should live um, and they're getting moved to a care home and the next thing we know that the last in power of attorney pops up. That could be an example of undue pressure. Or more obviously uh, and more usually where there are concerns about the attorney's behaviour if they're behaving in a way that contravenes their authority or is not in the best interest of the adult uh, viewed through the prism of section four and they're the most common applications 
So on the next couple of slides, uh, I've selected a few cases which illustrate how the court has used its section 22, subsection four power to revoke lasting power of attorney. Uh, and in Reg, um, we've got um, the uh, case of, which was decided by senior Judge Lush, uh, where it was decided that um, the attorney's behavior isn't confined to their behavior in the context of them being an attorney. If they're behaving in a way which is contrary to the adult's best interests um, in their wider life, um, then um, that will also uh, found reasons, uh, found uh, a basis on which the LPA can revoke. Um, in uh, Ray AMH, uh, an LPA was revoked uh, and um, the same attorney who uh, was the attorney under the revoked lasting power of attorney instrument was appointed as the deputy. Um, and the thinking behind that was that the accountability of a deputy is much higher. Um, and um, in those circumstances, um, the office of the public guardian had wider authority to keep an eye on them. Um, although um, it's a striking case to read is AMH because um, the attorney in question had no knowledge at all of the Mental Capacity Act um, of how best interest decisions should be formulated um, and um, no interest at all in learning about those or uh, acting in a way compatible with the Mental Capacity Act. Um, it, it was an unusual decision. Um, the decision of Ray F., which was a decision of Mr Justice Patton, uh, is also a helpful decision because it deals with uh, fallouts between attorneys uh, who are uh, siblings or other relatives. Um, and um, although the um, judge didn't remove the attorneys uh, in that case, he set out the test that um, attorneys will be removed if there's clear evidence, clear evidence that continuing hostility between the family members who are attorneys uh, will impede the proper administration of the donor's affairs or cause distress to the donor. Um, and of course, you see that um, in lots of cases where um, an adult has family around them who disagree about the adult's best interests um, and are squabbling and upsetting them. Um, and that would, in those circumstances, found grounds for the removal of attorneys. Um, that was uh, Mr Justice Patton's decision related to EPAs. Um, the dictum has been approved um, in the CSPL and the L case uh, in respect of lasting power of attorneys. Um, so that's how you remove an attorney. Once you've re removed an attorney or revoked a lasting power of attorney, um, the court will be keen and local authorities will be keen to make sure there is somebody else appointed to manage uh, the adult's property and affairs, and that will be by way of a deputy. Uh, again, there are two types of deputyship, personal welfare and property and financial affairs. Uh, and this session is concentrating again just on property and financial affairs. Uh, in fact, personal welfare deputyships are a rare uh, thing indeed. Uh, so how do we how do we appoint and decide who should be deputies? Uh, the starting point is that the Mental Capacity Act makes no reference at all to how a deputy should be chosen. Uh, and of course, the starting point for the court is, should there even be a deputy? Because a principle of the Mental Capacity Act is that um, if the court can take individual decisions without granting um, wholesale authority to a deputy, it should do. Uh, that said, um, generally speaking, for property and affairs, uh, a deputy will be appointed. Um, the case of Ray M, N, uh, N, O, and P um, is the leading authority about um, who should be um, the deputy. Uh, and the starting point is that the court prepares, prefer, prefers to appoint a family member or close friend. And it does so for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, they're familiar with the adult 
um, and are likely to be, be familiar with the adult's affairs, wishes and methods of communication. They'll have personal knowledge of the adult uh, and they'll be better able to meet the obligation of being the deputy to consult with the adults uh, and encourage them to participate in decision making as fully as possible than a professional. Uh, the second is one of economy. Professionals uh, are expensive um, and it's a drain on the adults' estate. And third is, well, we have to think about um, any um, reasons that would point against a family member um, and very often um, in cases where a deputy is being considered uh, there have been concerns or allegations of previous physical or financial abuse there's a conflict of interests um, or uh, the deputy simply isn't suitable to manage their own financial affairs um, and so they won't be uh, appropriate to manage the adults um, of the family members um, there is um, a, an informal um, order of preference which the court will have in mind. And it goes all the way back to this case from 1811, which is still the starting point. But generally speaking, uh, the starting point is uh, spouse or civil partner, um, some other relative, relative who takes a personal interest in the adult's affairs or a close friend. And only then uh, would the court look at professional advisors um, because of the cost. The, uh, the, it's useful, I think, for local authorities to know uh, about the re-BM case. And there's another case, which is Ray Bushy, uh, where the Court of Protection uh, has spelled out when it wouldn't be appropriate for family members and friends to be deputy. And this will weigh heavily in safeguarding investigations into financial abuse. Um, but the court is unlikely to appoint a family member to be the deputy uh, where the deputy is physically, psychologically, financially or emotionally abused, the adult, uh, where there is a need to investigate concerns that the adult has been financially abused. Um, and uh, we need somebody objective to uh, take the reins and investigate the adult's estate. Um, as I indicated earlier, where there's a real conflict of interests, that should say D there, the proposed deputy uh, has uh, an unsatisfactory satisfactory track record of managing their own affairs. And I can't see what's on the bottom of the slide. Um, e, where there is um, difficulties, fractured relationships between the family members. In, in fact, E is the ground which I see relied on most frequently in these sorts of applications before the Court of Protection that are brought by local authorities in safeguarding cases. Um, of course, um, if um, the adults ha has had a massive personal injury payout, um, then there's a need for them to have specialist advice about how to manage those funds. Um, and generally speaking, that wouldn't be left to a family member. Um, occasionally, it's left to a family member to act jointly with um, a professional deputy. Um, although those, can, uh, those arrangements often uh, can be quite tricky. Other things to think about when we decide who should be the deputy, um, what the adult themselves thinks about it. Um, and of course, if they uh, have somebody in mind who they really want to manage their uh, property and affairs, um, then there can be real benefits to that because the adult will feel like they're being uh, listened to. Um, that person um, may well um, have good knowledge of the adult and their affairs and be well placed to step into the shoes um, of the adult themselves. Um, also, um, particularly older people um, have a habit of entrusting their affairs to a particular relative or professional over a um, the course of their life and it would make sense to seek out that particular uh, professional. Uh, sometimes that can be a family solicitor, um, sometimes it might be um, somebody at the local church um, and those are things that have to be um, considered. Um, as I alluded to in the previous slide, the size and complexity of the state is also a relevant concern. Um, and if it's a larger, more complex estate, the less likely 
it is that a family member will be appropriate. Um, another um, aspect to consider are the qualities of the proposed deputy. Um, and um, here are the uh, things uh, to think about in that respect in the um, bullet points at the bottom of the slide. Um, the um, degree of contact that the family member has with the adult is, a, is an important one um, because um, a key advantage of a family member being the deputy is you'd expect them to see them often um, and um, have that consultation, which often does not come with professional uh, uh, deputies. Uh, there shouldn't be an obvious uh, conflict uh, of interest, um, but um, there will, uh, in most cases, be uh, conflicts of interest, which should be remedied by the uh, fiduciary duty, which the deputy would be under. So there's some examples um, of um, conflicts of interest which um, tend to be permitted on, on this slide. Um, most ob obvious example is a parent who is caring for um, the child um, and the court often allows a small fixed amount for them uh, each week or month uh, to remunerate them effectively for the work that they do for their relative in circumstances where um, they're unable to take a job or work a full-time job because of their care and responsibilities. Um, there are examples where um, a conflict of interest will be a bar to somebody becoming a deputy. I've put two examples in the middle of the slide. Um, the manager of a care home where the adult who's living shouldn't be the deputy, uh, nor should um, the partner uh, of a business that the adult has an interest in be uh, the deputy. Um, so uh, that's conflicts of interest. If you're supporting somebody to make an application to become a deputy, then it's the COP1, COP1A um, and COP4 uh, applications. And um, social workers are often asked to complete the assessment of capacity COP3 assessment. It all needs to be sent to the court with the um, court fee. Proceedings um, don't start until the court seals the application form. Um, and the court will scrutinise the application form before it is issued. And if it doesn't tick all the boxes, it will be returned unissued. Um, and then the court will do one or two things. Um, if the application um, is uh, contentious, if there's something unusual about it, or it's known that it's going to be contested, um, then uh, the adult is usually joined as a party uh, and the court will take steps to appoint a litigation friend and a solicitor list that matter for um, a hearing. Though usually at First Avenue House, they don't tend to get transferred to the regional courts unless there are linked welfare proceedings. Um, in the majority of cases, however, they're dealt with on papers um, and uh, generally granted without um, much litigation. Uh, the assessment of capacity for property and affairs um, looks at a wide range or should look at a wide range of aspects of decision making from day to day management of money and going to the shop and expecting change to paying bills um, and rent and mortgage or care home fees and, and those matters. Um, and ultimately, the order which the court will make if incapacity is found is that the adult lacks capacity to make some decisions about their property and affairs. Um, and the inference is it's not all decisions and it creates um, an onus on the deputy to think about each decision they're being asked to make and satisfy themselves that for that particular decision, the adult does lack capacity. It might be that if the adult's given £20, uh, they could go out shopping and buy themselves things and, and make those decisions about what that money's spent on. But the adult lacks capacity for the more routine and onerous uh, responsibilities of managing their utilities and budgeting at home. Um, so there are decisions within decisions uh, and the court deals with capacity in that respect. Um, once the application has been um, 
sealed and served by, uh, sealed and returned to the applicant by the court has to be provided to the adult who is given uh, the opportunity to object. Uh, rule uh, 42 sets out what the applicant needs uh, to tell the adult, um, in particular, uh, that the application suggests that the adult can't make their own decisions, what that means, um, what will happen if the court makes the order, so somebody will take over as the attorney and they'll make those decisions for the adult uh, and who that person will be. Um, and it's, it's, it's a strange procedure because it means that um, the application is being served on an adult who um, doesn't have insight into the concerns um, and very often um, or occasionally they'll complete the form and send it back and say they do object um, and um, that can cause significant delays in the proceedings. So what can deputies do um, under uh, an order? Well, the starting point is always the order because some orders are tailored to the specific circumstances of the case. Um, uh, the de deputy is also subject to apply the statutory principles in section one, two, three, and four of the Mental Capacity Act, um, which are set out here and they were set out uh, earlier in the slides in respect of um, attorneys. Um, the, the same statutory rules and guidance applies about the uh, deputy having to make sure that the adult lacks capacity to make the decision. Uh, they have to check that the order allows them to make uh, the decision on behalf of the adults. A good example is um, that, generally speaking, now deputyship orders do not uh, grant uh, a power to an, a deputy to sell a property um, which the adult owns without further authority of the court. And we'll cover that shortly in the in the slides. Um, and um, the court will want to um, put in place appropriate limitations on the power of the deputy. But in reality, uh, there's a balance to be struck uh, between um, letting the deputy get on and do what they need to do to make things uh, run smoothly for the adults um, and put in restrictions to keep the adults safe. Um, these are examples of some of the things that I've seen um, of the court limiting uh, the scope of a deputy's authority by way of an order. Um, so um, key examples are, as I've said, where an adult is living in the home and it doesn't need to be sold, not given the authority to sell it. Uh, making a restricted order where there's been a history of financial abuse or misuse of the adult's properties. Where uh, the adult circumstances are all up in the air. Uh, perhaps uh, they've come out of hospital and moved into respite care home um, and it's not clear where they're headed in the long term. Uh, where there are concerns about the deputy, uh, the proposed deputy's ability to manage the property affairs, um, but the adult's very keen that that deputy is uh, the person for them. Uh, and there are some others there, but they're the key ones. Um, in terms of the um, attitudes taken by the court to uh, risk that deputies might misuse um, an adult's uh, affair, uh, property and finances, uh, the court's attitude tends to be that the public guardian supervising that role is a deterrent, but you as local authority professionals will know um, the public guardian probably only gets involved after the abuse has taken place. Um, after the finance, uh, after the money's gone or the property's been sold. Um, and, and that's why deputyship imposes um, a, uh, a security that has to be paid into court before they're able to act. More about that later. Um, and there's some more examples of how the court might restrict uh, a um, deputy's power um, to act under the order. Um, what, is the, what is the legal status of a deputy? Uh, well, uh, they act as agent uh, for the um, adult, which means that any decisions they take on behalf of the adult are treated in law as a decision taken by the adult. 
uh, and there is no distinction in law. So if the adult um, has um, a deputy or an attorney for health and welfare who decides that the adult is going to live in a specific care home, the uh, adult is treated as having made that decision themselves if it's within the scope of the uh, authority. Um, so supervision, the uh, deputies are supervised by the Office of the Public Guardian, um, not the court is the point that I'm making there. Uh, the court uh, will uh, specify what level of supervision is required, but it's the Public Guardian who has the statutory powers to supervise deputies and take action if there are difficulties. Um, So um, deputies um, can't settle P's property or execute a will for P or exercise any power uh, vested in the adult as a trustee uh, in their role as a, a deputy. So there's further limitations. That, that, that last one about acting as a trustee uh, is relevant if there is the sale of a jointly owned property. So if the adult owns a property with somebody else and that property is to be sold, then there will also need to be an application for the appointment of a replacement trustee under the um, under Talata uh, in order to, for that sale to proceed. It might be that the person who is acting as the deputy also acts as the attorney, uh, as the trustee, but there's a, a separate application required for that. Um, the ACC case that's referenced there is a good case to look at the different scope of authority for deputies. Um, where P lives, uh, again, just as uh, an attorney for finance and property can't decide where an adult lives, uh, nor can uh, a deputy for finance and property. But again, they call the shots in terms of what the adult can afford, uh, and they make the arrangements for the adult uh, in practical terms when the decision about where they live has been made uh, for, for the reasons set out on that slide. Um, it is clear that if the adult moves to live with a, a family member in a property or in their home, um, then um, it's lawful and appropriate usually for the deputy to make a payment to that uh, relative in respect to the maintenance and upkeep of the property. That wouldn't be a safeguarding uh, reason. Uh, that's uh, quite sensible. Um, and um, again, if domiciliary care package is required, um, and that's um, to be privately arranged, it'd be the deputy that makes that arrangements. Likewise, uh, wherever the adult is living, the deputy must make the practical arrangements for the adult to have some money available for day-to-day -day expenditures such as groceries or if they're in a care home, it's things like activities and hairdressers visiting uh, or the beautician or, or having the nails done. Um, deputies are also responsible for management of personal possessions. Uh, they should uh, actively think about that if the adult goes into a care home or downsizes in terms of insurance or moving items into storage. Um, there's no doubt that um, direct payments can be managed uh, by um, a deputy on behalf of an adult, uh, but um, in a case that I imagine was well known to this local authority, because uh, it was a Calderdale case, um, the deputy is not a person who could insist or ask for a direct payment under Section 31 of the Care Act. But if the local authority thinks there should be one, the deputy can manage the direct payment. Excuse me. I'm running over slightly, so I apologise. Um, deputies can, in certain circumstances, litigate claims or pr court proceedings on behalf of um, an adult, but um, they need specific express authorization from the Court of Protection to issue proceedings and instruct solicitors at that point. Um, so they can get as far as sending a letter before claim and receiving a response but it can't go beyond that. Um, so it's selling property. Um, and as I indicated earlier, generally speaking, that express power is excluded from uh, general orders. Um, and if the uh, 
authority is sought for the deputy to sell a property. And there are a number of things which uh, the court will want to see. Um, and they are um, that uh, there needs to be assurances that the uh, adult is unlikely to move back to the home that's been sold. Uh, the court will be concerned to see whether the, uh, there is appropriate authorization in place for the adults if they're living in residential care. Um, so some assurance that they have capacity to make a decision to live at the care home and they are deciding to live there or uh, a standard authorization or an order of the court authorizing the arrangements if it's supported living. They'll need to see a careful best interests assessment um, evidenced usually in a balance sheet way with the pros and cons of the options um, and uh, they'll need assurances that the property will be sold on the best terms and at open market rate um, and um, trustee as we've spoken about earlier um, for court of protection uh, for applications for the sale of just uh, jointly owned properties gifts um, Pretty much the same um, as the position for attorneys that we discussed earlier. Uh, maintenance, um, a deputy will have to pay maintenance to a family member if that was an established practice before the adult last, lost capacity. Um, very often, um, if an adult is paying a maintenance to uh, a son or a daughter, physically if there are disabilities in place or, 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 uh, or that sort of thing, that obligation should continue. Um, and we've dealt with um, conflicts of interest. But the more guidance here from the Buckley judgment, uh, funds of the deputy must be separate uh, from um, the uh, adults. Funds, uh, investments, investments if they're made, should be in the adult's name and executed by the deputy as the deputy for the adults. Um, in terms of deputies remuneration, they get fixed fees usually in accordance with the practice directions and rules of court. Um, if they go over the fixed fees and there's a good reason, they can apply for assessment by the senior court's cost office. Uh, so that's deputies. Um, I don't think I could conclude this without mentioning ordinary powers of attorneys, uh, which um, are not lasting power of attorneys. Um, they are a deed which allows somebody else usually to sign or execute a document on their behalf. Um, they're quite common in commercial law and contract law, um, but every now and then um, they crop up in safeguarding inquiries by local authorities. Um, and you'll need to get careful advice uh, about the effectiveness of ordinary powers of attorneys. Uh, finally, um, think about whether an attorney or a, a deputyship is necessary. Uh, because, of course, um, appointeeship uh, also provides uh, useful um, uh, arrangements um, to manage welfare benefits on behalf of an adult. Uh, there are uh, two useful resources that I wanted to flag with you all um, in the context of what we've been talking about. Um, the first is the guidance from um, STEP and COPPER about seeking an order for sale, which is available on the website. Um, I'll try and put it on the screen now so you can see that. Um, no, it looks like that's going to be beyond me, but uh, I'll circulate it. I think it's been circulated with the slides and it, it takes uh, you on a step-by-step -step basis uh, through uh, the requirements that the court is going to be looking for the sale of a property. Um, and the other one is a template court of protection order um, uh, that's available on the government, on the court of protection, on the OPG's website. Uh, it tells you uh, the key terms and what they look like. Um, so you can uh, look at orders that have been made. So I don't know if there are any questions uh, we've covered um, everything that I uh, thought we needed to cover, but if there are any questions, now's the time to ask them. Well, there aren't uh, any questions that I can see popping up, um, so um, I've probably uh, bored you all to death. 
uh, and uh, we'll bring the training to an end. Oh, here we go. We've got a, a question. What's the best resource to send to family who need reminding uh, of lasting power of attorney duties? Um, there will be a guide on the Office of, uh, Office of the Public Guardian's website um, about, uh, in simple terms about what uh, attorneys should do. So I can probably dig that out and send that through to you, Maria, uh, if that is uh, of any help. Um, but it doesn't look like there are any other messages, so we'll we'll close the training at that point. And thank you very much for your uh, time this this evening. Take care.